Okay, so now we are moving on to look at this chapter on diagonalization. Okay. Okay, so vector spaces have more than one basis, and some of these bases are more useful than others for thinking about particular problems. For example, consider the standard first-year physics statics problem of a box resting on an inclined plane. Although we are used to describing R2 with a canonical basis, well, I hate it when they do this, just for like formatting purposes, why not just you know, you know just write it like this? Okay, they mean that, you know, because it's transpose of that thing. The first step we might take in analyzing the box on the plane is to describe the forces acting on the box in terms of a new basis, whose elements are a unit vector parallel to the plane and a vector perpendicular to it. Okay, cool. Not important, but just a motivation thing. It is this idea, choosing an appropriate basis to describe a problem in a simple way, that motivates this section on diagonalization. Okay. You know, if you look up this stuff online, I think a lot of the stuff in this diagonalization chapter is really called, it's called like the spectral theorem and stuff. It's about finding the spectrum of matrix. And then you can do it for linear operators in general. It's very interesting and very useful in quantum mechanics. Okay, anyway, a first example. To illustrate, to illustrate how useful diagonalization is, we will solve a system of linear differential equations. You won't be able to follow all the steps. The margins include the questions you might be asking yourself. Okay, so this is gonna, again, so it's more motivation or whatever. Okay, so this, we want to solve this differential equation, this system of differential equations. Okay, so this is the first system of differential equation we've seen, I think. So so far in this course, we've had we've had systems of linear systems of linear equations, and we've had differential equations, and then we've seen how differential we've said we've had, for example, and most importantly, I think, linear differential equations. But now we have a system of differential equations. In fact, a system of those linear differential equations. Yeah, a system of differential equations. Okay, wait, wait. You can write this more compactly as x dash equals matrix A times the matrix vector x, where this matrix A is this has these coefficients, right? Okay, that's. Hopefully, you can see how that how that works. Anyway, now let x equal p y, where p is one 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 five. Okay, so we're making a change of variables. Effectively, we're letting y equal the inverse of p times x. And then this is going to be given us new variables. Uh, P, we're going to figure out, we're going to see later where P comes from, why we chose this P. If we substitute into the equation 4.1, we're going to see, we're going to see right now why we chose this P, because it works, it's helped solve it. We're going to see later how we actually calculate that P. Okay, if we substitute into the equation 4.1, okay, substitute in PY, where we see X, you get PY dash equals AP, APY. PY dash because P is just a uh, matrix of constants. And so it's, it's like, it works the same as when you differentiate a constant times a function. You just have the constant times the derivative of the function. Okay. Now we multiply on both sides by the inverse of P. Question, how do we know P is invertible? I think we can answer that already, actually. The determinant of this is not zero, or another way of saying it is the columns are linearly independent. Okay. So we have the inverse of P. Multiply both sides by inverse of p to get y dash equals p inverse ap. Okay. Hold on a second. Let's start Okay. And now we have the product p inverse ap, but that's actually the diagonal matrix. Okay. It says check it yourself. Okay. So, so p inverse times a times p. So what is the inverse of P? So P is 1, 1, 1, 5. So the inverse will be 1 over the determinant, which is 5 minus 1, which is, so it's quarter. But it's 4, so we're 1 over 4, 1 of the determinant. Then we have the, con the transpose of the cofactor matrix. So the cofactor matrix would be, so the cofactor of the top left is going to be 5. Bottom right would be 1. And these will cofactors will be one and one. No, they'll be minus one and minus one because you they're odd entries. Then you take the transpose of that, and it's actually the same as is the thing itself, right? Okay, because it's symmetric. Okay. Ooh. Okay, so we have there's a P. And multiplying then we have the A, which is what? Two, five, minus one, minus four, and then we have P. One, 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 five. Okay. 
So we do this multiplication, we get what? So first of all, we have quarter, and then we have this, this thing. Okay, so let's do this A times B. What's that? That's going to give us um, first entry will be 2 minus 1, which is 1. Next entry will be 2 minus 5, which is minus 4. Oh, minus 3, sorry. Then we have 5 minus 4, which is 1. And then we have 5 minus 20, which is minus 15. Okay, now still got the quarter. Now we do 5 minus 1 is 4. Then minus 15 plus 15 is 0. And then minus 1 plus 1 is 0. And then 3 uh, what's it? It's 3 plus 15 is yeah, no, sorry, it's 3 minus 15, which is minus 12. Okay, so we get we actually get 1, 0, 0, and then we don't get m minus 2 there. This is divided by 4, so this is minus 3. Oh. Um, we, got, we didn't get minus 2, we got minus 3. I notice there's a minus 3 here as well, so I think this must be a typo on their part. So this is minus 3. Okay, let's see if that works. Well, it certainly is diagonal. We have the minus 3. Now it says this is equivalent to the system differential equations. So yeah, we have y, y dash equals dy, where d is this diagonal matrix. Yes, it's 1, so it's going to be... So we now have y dash equals d times y. Okay, so y, of course, is y1, y2. y dash is y1 dash, y2 dash. So we get 1 times, top row is 1 times y1, second row is minus 3 times y2, yes. Okay, that. Now, each of these equations only contain one variable. So the original system of equations, right, the derivative of x1 depended on x1 and x2. The derivative of x2 depended on x1 and x2, so that's why that makes it difficult to solve. But now we have y1 dash equals y1. That's an easy thing to solve. It's, this is the solution, e to the t. y2 dash equals the minus 3y2, again, easy to solve e to the minus 3, e to the minus 3t, okay. Now, that solves the y, but then we want the actual, we want the x. Well, x actually equals p times y. So we can use these solutions to recover the solutions to the original system. You take, that, you take the solutions you have, y1 and y2, and you multiply by, on the left, by p, because that was the change of variable you made, and you get that, right? 1 times that plus 1 times that, 1 times that plus 5 times that, yep. And now, now if you if you can rearrange this to bring out the alpha and the et from each thing, you have one one and one five, and that's interesting. It's interesting to get this because one one and one five. Because look, originally here we had the p was one 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 five, and this is actually a thing that will always happen. You actually, you'll actually be able to, if you want, to skip lots of these steps and just once you found the p matrix. In fact, you'll later see where the columns come from. Once you've found these columns, you'll actually be able to just write down the solution like this. Well, actually, you need to, once you found the e to the t and the e to the minus 3t. But you'll actually, you'll be able to figure out, you'll know from other things what the, that, is, that this is e to the t and that's e to the minus 3t. So you'll be able to skip lots of this working out. It's similar to when you're doing variable parameters, you can skip lots of the theory, basically, and just go straight to writing down the solution. Okay. Well, this example illustrates the basic motivation for why diagonalization is useful, but let's explain how to diagonalize a given matrix. Okay, so this, was, this thing was diagonalization. We took a matrix A, this matrix A, right here, which wasn't diagonal, and we... Hold on a second, sorry. Took this matrix, which A, which wasn't diagonal, and we sort of made it diagonal in the sense that we wrote it in the form diagonal matrix equals P inverse AP. Okay, that's what diagonalizing means, what making it a diagonal is. And actually what it is, is it's a, this P is a change of basis. That's why there was this whole thing in the beginning about change of basis. So it's basically like 
the, the, matrix, the matrix A, right, is not diagonal. But in a certain basis, it is diagonal. So this P converts into that, well, actually converts from that basis. And this inverse of P converts back to that basis. So it's like, you know, vector comes in in the basis in which, in which A is diagonal, is converted into the original form, the original basis for A, the standard basis. It's operated on by A, is converted back into the, way in the, the, the basis in which A is diagonal. And so if you do that process, then this, convert, this thing will be diagonal, so it's a diagonal matrix. Alternatively, you can multiply both sides by P and P inverse, and you'll get um, P, P inverse. A, right, and now this is saying A is diagonal in this new basis. So it's like a vector comes in, okay, P inverse transforms it into the basis in which A is diagonal. D is A in this diagonal basis. So it does the transformation, and then P transforms you back into the basis, the original basis. And so then that whole process is just like doing A. Okay, that's sort of why it's called diagonalization and why the, we talked in the beginning about um, a basis. Okay, um, that's it for now.